Welcome to Accounting Life with Jotham Tai, a space where we'll talk about anything and everything surrounding the people that grind through your month end accounting clothes. Hi, everyone. Today's episode is about financial planning and analysis and accounting collaboration. Our guest today is Bijan Moalemi, co founder and CEO at Mosaic. On this episode, we'll discuss life as a founder versus life in corporate finance the relationship between FP&A and accounting, how life is different when you move from accounting into FP&A, and the best way to sync up FP&A and accounting in your organization. Now I'll hand it over to our host, Gapify CEO, Jotham Tai. Bij, thanks so much for joining us today. We're so excited to have you on the podcast. Jotham, likewise, uh, really been looking forward to it. Yeah, so I know you and I have known each other for a few years. We've uh, caught up with each other a few times. Um, but just for the audience's sake, could you tell us more about your corporate background and how you got into Mosaic? Yeah, absolutely. So quick rundown, uh, went to school down here in San Diego at UCSD, uh, management science degree, so economics, math. Did two years of corporate fp at Qualcomm down here in San Diego. Really great learning opportunity. Wanted to do something a little faster pace. Got really lucky, uh, joined Palantir in uh, late 2011, early 2012. Very different environment building out the finance team there than working for a Fortune 50 company at Qualcomm. Spent six years at Palantir, uh, saw the company through a hyper growth stage. Uh, I think we were almost 2,500 folks by the, by the time we left. Took a quick stint as a CFO of another high growth BC back company, Piazza. And it was kind of during that time, as well as the, the Palantir years, that really felt like we had an idea uh, in the finance space that we wanted to pursue. So post Piazza, uh, my two co-founders, Joe and Brian, who we, uh, we met for the first time at Palantir, decided to, to start Mosaic. Awesome. Yeah, and I've heard so many great things. And obviously, I've followed your products and, and your journey over the years uh, really closely. And congrats on all the success. Congrats on the latest funding round. Yeah, really excited about uh, hearing about all the, the great news coming your way. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, right back at you. And um, I, I think there's, there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, uh, not just from me, but the entire company that's behind the scenes that, that lead to some of those big events. So I'm, I, I'm sure you've got uh, similar stories on your side. Oh, goodness. Do I have stories, Bij? Uh, and it actually great segue to to the, you know, one of the first questions I wanted to ask, and, and you and I can appreciate all the hard work that goes behind the scenes and building a company and building brand new product, uh, introducing new you know, concepts to the market. A lot of tough, tough stuff going on there, but you know, I, I always get a lot of questions about you know, what life is like now as a founder versus, I'm sure similar in your case, uh, someone who's coming from corporate finance. You and I have both like month close schedules. We had 10 Qs, 10 Ks, yep. and now we're working on this, you know, on, on these really amazing and bold ideas and our, our days are very dynamic, right? So I, how would you describe like how life is different from you as a founder now versus what it was like, you know, back in corporate finance? Yeah. Yeah. Really great question. So look, I think uh, corporate finance, fp a especially working at a, a high growth company like the Palantir, you're working a lot. So uh, the, the, I'd say the element of it that you touched on is, especially as you start to get the hang of things, there is more routine and kind of cyclicality to, to the work. I think that was really one of the main reasons for me wanting to leave Qualcomm is I probably could have told you down to the day, maybe even to the hour what are the meetings I'm going to have? Who are the folks across the business that I'm meeting with? What are some of those deliverables? Uh, when am I getting certain reports done in the context of the month and close, et cetera? So it was a nice change of pace to, to join Palantir where we didn't have a closed process. In fact, we hadn't even closed the books in two years uh, by the time I joined. Um, but, but towards the end, I think it, we did start to nail the systems, the processes. And so things things were more, were more routine and structured. And I think that as a founder and CEO, there is no such day that, that's routine. Things are different every single day. And there's been days where you think you've got your, your calendar mapped out, something comes up and 
uh, everything that was on your calendar is being ripped off and you're, you're focused on a, a fire drill for that given day. So yeah, predictive, uh, there's no predictive predictability. And I'd say flexibility, uh, is, is crucial to, to being an early stage founder. When I've given up on the notion beach that we can ever have like a set lunch schedule. I try it at, at certain points at <laughs> my time here at Gapify. I'm going to lock down lunch and I'm going to have it at a certain time of day. But boy, uh, yeah, definitely not doable, <laughs> especially you know, for, for high growth startups like us. For sure. Yeah, I, I wish I was there. I'm a little better these days about making sure I'm eating lunch each day, but uh, I'm right there with you. The, the consistent routine is tough. Exactly. Yeah, just being able to fit in that lunch is a challenge in itself, but yep. scheduling it uh, in a consistent way is a whole another level. But yeah, I mean, I, I really was excited to get you on this on this episode because of your corporate finance background. Definitely want to spend some time talking about Mosaic as well. But a lot of the questions that our viewers have, you know, relate to FPNA because of the tight partnership uh, that exists, obviously, between the controllership and FPNA. And just you know, thinking about your time in uh, at Palantir, for example, like how would you? describe the, the significance and the importance and the criticality of the relationship between fp &A and finance. And I'll lead in with an example, uh, you know, just really quickly. For me, it's, you know, the functional answer is we can't close the books until fp &A goes yeah. through their soft close, gets us all the reclasses. We can't like lock down the books without that partnership with fp &A. That's why, like from a functional perspective, super crucial. But I'd love to hear in your own words, you know, how, how would you describe that relationship? Yeah, look, I, I think the difference between companies that have a good finance function and a great or a world-class function uh, are the ones where there's strong cohesion, uh, not just inside of the finance org, but between finance and the rest of the business broadly. So when I think about Palantir in those early days, it, we were still struggling to communicate between FP&A and the accounting team. And then, of course, you start to get the right systems in place, start to recognize that symbiotic relationship that you alluded to where uh, FP&A can actually help with the soft close. And uh, there's an opportunity for those two teams to work together, partner together, and help each other in their day-to-day. -day. Uh, and then I'd say the, the next phase for us was FP&A, in general, at least at Palantir, was going to be more forward-facing, working with different folks from across the business. But as we started to really build those relationships and having our accounting team take part in some of those meetings, whether it's specific RevRec on customer deals, talking to the go-to-market team or whatnot, I'd say that's when uh, things were really clicking for us is really breaking down those silos, not just between accountants and fp &A analysts, but really between finance and, and the rest of the business and having the accounting team uh, be a, a, a meaningful stakeholder in those discussions as well. Yeah. And I think a lot of times we on the controllership are guilty of not proactively seeking those types of discussions with fp &A, right? And I know how and you've probably been in situations where there's just so much going on during the course of the month. You, you dive right into month then and all you really get in terms of partnership with fp &A is kind of correcting some of the, the entries that are going in. But obviously, ideally, the situation where accounting and controllership is partnering with fp &E before the close and, and trying to figure out what those changes should be. It seems ideal, but I know easier said than done. Um, but there's so much that that type of relationship can, can unlock in terms of closing the books quickly and you know, just having better quality financial statements. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And I think for anyone who's stepping into one of those roles at a new company, that would probably be my first piece of advice. Uh, and it's actually a piece of advice that I give to anyone at Mosaic as well, regardless of what function they're in is you feel that urge to step into the day to day. There's a million things on your plate and it's like, oh my gosh, how am I going to get all this work done? But you do need to go make time to build and strengthen those relationships, earn trust with your teammates. And uh, although you might not see the benefits week one, week two, week three, carving out that time early on to your point will go a long way starting to get regular meetings on the calendar between uh, the fp &A team and the accountants, making sure that they're, they're giving you the info that you need so you're not stuck in a vacuum. Uh, we've all been there cranking away, trying to get uh, clothes done on time. 
working uh, behind our monitors, just cranking away in Excel. And that's, that's not a fun place to be. So I think it all, it all comes down to relationships uh, and, and trust, not just between finance, but uh, other parts of the business as well. I think I've got the secret weapon for unlocking those relationships. I think it's automation, automation <laughs> on the finance side and Gapify on the controllership side. And all kidding aside, that's what really creates a time that we need, right? So if we can get out of these spreadsheets, maintaining it and focus on the relationship aspect and forming these, you know, really strong bonds between these two groups, the quality of the close and the numbers just substantially increase. And you can't, you can't create time, but you can create automations to, to manufacturing that time that, that you need. So we'll get more into our, our systems in a bit. But you know, also one of the, the topics that I hear from fellow accountants and controllerships, they're fascinated by what happens in corporate and strategic finance. We are at one point in time, I think a lot of us in the controllership think about making that move. And actually, before I ask you the question, I would love to, uh, to call on my, my friend Ryan here. Uh, because I, I would assume he would have the same kind of baseline understanding of what the difference is between FP&A and, and accounting as like most of the folks that we partner with. So Ryan, finance and accounting are actually not the same in, in corporate finance, but just to put you on the spot in a very awkward way, uh, how would you, what would be your guess, best guess as to what the difference is between the two groups? Between financial planning and accountants? Yes. Well, this is a, I mean, this is fun that I'm sitting in on this because it is blowing my mind that accountants don't sit in on these meetings. So the way you're describing it, I'm, I'm picturing that the accountants are kind of like down on a, a different floor or a different department, just checking the books <laughs> and F, fp and is more of your, maybe your C-suite type people who are doing like your vision and your planning. And that, that conversation between those two isn't, isn't taking place, but that's purely a guess based on what you've just described. That is a really good guess, uh, okay. Ryan. Yeah, it's it's uh, some of the, those components are definitely, um, you know, what those differences are. So for us in the controllership and accounting, we're focused on recording transactions that have already happened, right? Versus the planning side, they're more uh, prospective and and but that type of knowledge and the information that they have is critical because it gives us the foresight on on determining what to record during any given given month. Did I say that right, Vij? I, I yeah, no, I, I, I think you did. I, I think you did. And I, I think the important thing to point out there is, whereas FP&A may be focused more on the present, but really the future, you can't do that properly without having a strong base and understanding of the past. And so that's why that relationship is so important. And the two roles, although distinct, are so tightly connected at the same time. They are. I mean, we're all working from the same set of numbers, right? The output, the final output of the financial statements is a you know, conglomerate of all the different activities from the different finance and accounting teams. Uh, so we're all working on the same team. But to your point, Ryan, sometimes the silos that organizations develop, you lead you be to believe that they're working on different floors. So I, I love that expression. It reminds me of some of the, the um, companies I've worked at back in the day. <laughs> But Bij, going back to the question of accountants thinking about a career in FP&A. So, you know, for me, I would summarize a difference as, you know, if you stick with the controllership, you may get a variety of like operational experience and a lot of different systems because you have payroll, AR, there's so much variety there. And then finance is more strategic, right? So more, and you still collaborate with different teams, but it's a different type of objective. It's not so much like keeping the lights on like from a mechanical level, but more so like strategic. So I don't know if I, I describe that properly, but how would you kind of you know, describe for someone who's thinking about going F into FP&A, like what their life, how their life is going to be different in FP&A versus the controllership? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the life is definitely going to be different. You're going to spend as much time in Excel, uh, unless you have a, a tool like a Gapify or a Mosaic or some of the other latest uh, softwares out there in the office of the CFO. But I think where where you spend your time is going to be different. Um, to, to your point on the accounting side, everything more revolves around the month end close, making sure that foundation is very, very strong, understanding the flow of funds, that the financial statements are accurate. 
FP&A really takes that foundation and tries to run with it. So would be putting a different spin on the numbers. The business doesn't think in terms of balance sheet and cash flows. It's presenting the data in a way that makes sense to business owners and then understanding more of their strategic initiatives. And then how do you present data to help aid them in that decision-making? So that's kind of at a high level how I would think about how, how that day-to-day might differ, uh, but, but still a lot of number crunching for sure. Yeah, well, and I think if I am correct about this, I, I sense that when you're over on the finance side, there's greater, it's much more important for you to understand the numbers that you are working with than it is in the controllership. And what I mean by that, I'll just give some examples. And it actually drives me crazy that over the years that I've been in accounting that I used to see accountants just kind of go through the motion of like recording entries for the sake of getting it in. You know, my month end close checklist tells me I have to capitalize R&D, so I'm going to do it. But we sometimes we accounts don't really immerse ourselves in understanding why we're doing it and what actually the business kind of the nature of the business that's driving you know those types of transactions. So I would assume in finance, though, you can't just like get by with, OK, debits go here, credits go there. You yeah. kind of have to yeah. you know, what the numbers mean, right? Yeah, a- absolutely. Right. The first time you go to uh, a business review, maybe you're looking over the month end numbers, the quarterly numbers with your head of sales. He's trying to understand why revenue was lower, why expenses were higher than forecasted. And if you can't give an articulate business reason why that was the case, that that meeting's not going to go very well. So definitely spend a lot of time drilling into the numbers, understanding not just the the numbers themselves, but the business reasons why certain things did or didn't happen. Exactly. Exactly. Well, and I'm going to look straight at the camera right now for any GL folks or accounting managers, senior accountants, I know you may be just responsible for the expense side of, of the P&L, but you got to know what the revenue streams are and just to, to know what, you're, what company you're working for. So Bij, I'm saying this because I have been in places before where people don't even know the revenue streams on the GL side. Uh, they don't get the, the revenue streams of the c- companies that they work for. And I, it's, it's maddening to me. So if you're thinking about going to fp a you know, that picking up that level of curiosity, I think is, is important for a success in, in that new role. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, when I'm looking at kind of vetting candidates uh, in former lives as a finance operator, but definitely here at Mosaic as well, curiosity is always at the top of the list. Uh, you have to find folks that are curious. And look, I, I think something else that we didn't touch on you want to be well-rounded. And uh, I, I was coming in out of school with more of an FP&A traditional background, no, no expertise in accounting. So uh, I will say this, accountants who are looking to get into FP&A strategic finance with a solid understanding of accounting actually have a leg up. Understanding the nuances of accounting will go a long way and give you another tool in the toolkit that a lot of your peers won't necessarily have. So uh, I'd say some of the, the best FP&A folks that I've worked with uh, actually come from an audit or accounting background where they've really cut their teeth on that side of the house and think it's a really, really valuable skill set to have uh, and will will aid you massively if you make that shift into FP&A down the line. Yeah, I mean, I've got a perfect example just to support what you just shared there, uh, Beach. So in my audit days and in my SOX compliance days, I mean, part of it is reviewing board meeting minutes, right? So I can go through the motion of just reviewing it just for the sake of getting the, or looking for the red flags, but I actually immerse myself in, you know, trying to understand what the nature of the resolutions were and board structure and, you know, board meeting format. And here I am now ha- having to manage a board myself yep. and, yep. you know, the context is helping out big time. And, and so, yeah, I think that's important. Like finding talent with that level of curiosity is, is you know, crucial for success and great segue to, to automation and, and, you know, the, the vision that you and I are, are uh, building for both sides of the finance and accounting house. And for me, the reason why I started Gapify, probably very, very similar to, to you and your partners. If I want to be a successful accountant, I need to be strategic. I need to collaborate. And I can't do any of that if I'm spending half of my day just running spreadsheets, exporting reports from different systems, uh, doing V lookups and uh, managing 25 megabit Excel files. Like we need to get out of that to be able to do more with ourselves. So, you know, wanted to ask 
you, Beach, like you know, in starting Mosaic, was that part of the kind of the storyline as well? It is. It is. I feel like you stole our pitch there. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it's exactly the same. Uh, we, we like to say that, and I guess this is probably applicable broadly in the office of the CFO, not just not just finance. Eighty percent of the work that you do is actually going to be back office and not strategic. And so how do we actually flip that on its head so that 80% of your time is focused on more strategic initiatives with 20% being pulling down data from disparate systems, the crazy V lookups, H lookups, cleaning, mapping, normalizing data. Uh, That's not a value add. You do that in pursuit of more strategic initiatives. So anything you can do to get leverage back uh, is, is really the name of the game. And I can appreciate the level of work now because I'm having to you know, do both fp work and accounting work uh, at my own company and just have a strong level of appreciation for the types of reports that investors want. Uh, and as easy as it sounds like to have an ARR by customer report, it is not. It's super manual for those that don't have a, a solution like Mosaic. So you know, can, we, can you maybe describe some of the yeah, the features that you, as you talk to fellow FP&A professionals, like what are parts of your, your, your solution, your product that resonates with them the most in terms of like saving yeah. work? Yeah, it, it's funny that you mentioned the ARR waterfall. Uh, that, that's always one of our biggest wow factors. So we will connect into your source of truth, whether that's your ERP system, your billing system, or your CRM, pull in data at the lowest level. Uh, and so it'd actually be just three clicks for, for you to pull your ARR waterfall by customer. So something that typically takes uh, folks in Excel or another system hours, uh, it sounds like you have that pain, would be done in a matter of seconds with, with Mosaic. So uh, I think where our product shines is really touching on automation when it comes to board deck reporting, any other sort of analysis that you're going to routinely update and share cross-functionally with different personas, whether that's uh, business owners, folks who have a portion uh, of a budget, an investor, et cetera, uh, as well as the forecasting side. I think I, I'm sure you have a budget of forecast that, that you're maintaining, rolling that forward each month, understanding the variances, making updates to that model, maybe different scenarios. You can spend days, if not weeks, doing that. And so really trying to streamline and automate that process is another selling point of our tool. Well, we will be investing in Mosaic, not only because we are doing this episode with you, Beach, but it is definitely, we, we're at the scale now where this is taking too much work. Yeah, you know, I mentioned AR by customer report, uh, also retention cohort, yep. that dollar retention rate. I spend more time collecting and compiling data than actually trying to get meaningful insights from it. Uh, so yeah, we are going to, to, to definitely uh, implement a solution. Um, and Mosaic, uh, you know, from what I've seen and also from knowing you over the years, it's a perfect fit for us. Thank you. Appreciate the kind words. Well, and it goes back to our story, right? Like, I don't want to spend time chasing. And in fact, I'll take it a step further, Beach. We actually, are, these reports that I shared with you, we named it after the person that's putting it together manually. So it's called the Jordan Report. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it probably takes a lot of time to, to put it together and I also poor, poor have to Jordan. <laughs> I know poor Jordan so we, we got to make this investment soon definitely but yeah just as uh, to wrap up and and as you know one last piece of closing advice you know again the topic and the theme that we wanted to hone in on for this episode was just FPNA and accounting partnership so as a parting advice along the you know that topic like what would you want to share to the accountants in our uh our viewers here today. Yeah, look, I, I'm a big fan of focus and prioritization and trying to say less things than a lot. So I, I think in the spirit of what we've been talking about, and I really agree with the points you made, let's double, let's double down on that. It's going the extra mile, staying curious and communicating with your peers. I'd say if, if there's one thing that I learned being in finance, and I think this is applicable to accounting as well. There is more to running a business than just looking at the numbers and staying behind your, your MacBook Pro all day, cranking in Excel will tell one story, but you have to be out there communicating, not just as a finance org, but, but with folks across the business to really get the full picture of the business. So uh, that, that would be uh, my number one theme for, for today is stay curious, ask questions, 
uh, and then go out of your way. And I think you do need to go out of your way because to your point, otherwise it's so easy to get sucked into the million things that go on to really carve out time with other folks in the finance org, ask to be involved in budget planning meetings where applicable and, and really just try to broaden your horizon by staying curious. I love that. And it's a philosophy I've adopted um, subconsciously throughout my career. And I think that's part of the reason why you know, folks like you, you and, and I have been able to create the vision that, that we have for our profession is because we were curious about how things can be better. Uh, so that's a great way to wrap up the conversation. And Bij, thank you so much for joining us today. We got to do this more often and uh, you know, offline too. We'd love to catch up and, and we're going to make an investment in Mosaic. So really appreciate you joining us today. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was a ton of fun, Jotham. Awesome. Thanks for stopping by. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you want more information, please check us out at gapify.com. And we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.